Dr. Catania. Can people hear me back there? Yes? And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And it's great to be here, and it's really great to be in front of a live audience. So thank you all for coming. And thank you for inviting me to give this prestigious lecture um, to honor uh, the memory of Rita Levy Montalcini, who of course was a great and a hero to many of us who try our best to combine biochemistry with cell physiology and whole animal physiology. Um, so today, uh, I, I'm not going to speak actually uh, uh, directly about the ion channels and natural products that we've identified. I thought for today, in the context of this lecture, I want to tell you about some newer work that we've done to probe uh, mechanisms of pain signaling in the gut. I know that this is a brain research organization, but some people call the gut the second brain, so I think that this fits in well enough. Um, and uh, uh, so thanks ag uh, again for coming, and, and let me begin. Let me begin by um, reiterating something that Dr. Catanio said, which is that our pain system is, uh, we have this balance of acute protection versus chronic uh, maladaptive pain. So I would say, and perhaps I'm prejudiced in this way, that our pain system and the somatosensory system, I think of all our senses as the one that's most uh, necessary for our survival and well-being. And we'll hear later about mutations in, in, uh, in various aspects of these systems that render people insensitive to pain. Those people are at great risk of injury and death. Uh, and so we need our pain system to survive. Uh, but the problem is that pain can outlive its usefulness as an acute warning system and instead become chronic and debilitating. And one of the challenges in this field is to understand how this switch occurs with the goal of either preventing it or reversing it. Uh, and so uh, cr chronic pain, we, took, we use the word pain as one word as we do cancer, but we know that chronic pain mechanisms are multifarious. They're, uh, they, they, uh, they're somehow related perhaps, but also mechanistically distinct. Uh, and one of the goals in this field is to understand how different types of pain syndromes differ and what the mechanistic underpinnings are. So how does lower back pain, for example, differ from osteoarthritic knee pain, from uh, 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 post-herpetic neuralgia pain, from migraine pain, et cetera. And I think it's only when we can understand the differences in mechanisms among these different pain systems can we really think about pharmacological and other strategies to adequately treat them uh, because one strategy is not going to work to treat all pains. We even know this uh, from the most uh, potent analgesics uh, that exist, namely opioid analgesics. They work for some chronic pain syndromes, but not others. Uh, we uh, have focused, so in, in an effort to do this, we focused on one or two models of pain, and the one that we've worked on for the last few years is to really try and understand mechanisms of visceral pain. This is pain, of course, that is, affects visceral organs like the GI tract or the bladder. Uh, and, and we've been studying uh, mechanisms of, uh, of, of chronic pain that affect uh, the GI tract in particular. And, and this is really an interesting area because it affects a large number of people, approximately 15% of the population. The other interesting thing about it is that it can be post-inflammatory or post-infectious. So, uh, for example, irritable bowel syndrome is a very common form of visceral pain. Uh, it's, uh, the most common instigator is a uh, severe bout of food poisoning uh, that leads to uh, a number of sequelae, inflammation, tissue damage, etc. But long after that damage is gone, uh, one is left, can be left with uh, visceral hypersensitivity and pain for many days, weeks, months, or years. Uh, and this sort of quote-unquote functional pain syndrome is, is, is an interesting model for understanding uh, chronic pain syndromes that last long after signs of injury have gone. And this is really a, a uh, not only a mechanistically interesting problem, but it's a confounding problem for people in the clinic because uh, this really sort of represents the uh, difficulty of, of, of uh, clinical care uh, for physicians diagnosing pain in, uh, in, in, in subjects or their patients who come in who have no obvious sign of injury but complain of a persistent pain syndrome. The other interesting thing about visceral pain is that there's a big gender disparity. So women suffer from visceral pain syndromes about two or three times more frequently than men. In fact, if you ever see a television commercial for treatment of things like IBS pain, it, you never see a man in those commercials. Very rarely, it always features a woman, usually uh, mid, in midlife. Uh, and so we know that this gender disparity exists. And understanding the basis, mechanistic basis of this, is not only an interesting but a really important 
uh, concept, and this is something that I'll talk about today. There's, a, as is the case for most pain syndromes, there's a lack of biomarkers, or, for, or in many cases in these functional uh, um, pain syndromes, uh, overt pathology. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and understanding mechanism may lead to an elaboration or to, uh, uh, to an identification of various types of molecules secreted or other things that one can use to diagnose uh, more objectively things like functional pain disorders. Uh, and the sensory mechanisms remain obscure. Uh, as you'll see, there are complex interactions in these systems that can contribute to, uh, to these different types of pain syndromes. The other thing that's quite interesting about visceral pain is that it really sort of sits at the nexus of a number of really uh, fascinating signaling systems. So there's inflammation and interaction with the microbiome, uh, as we know, in the gut. This then can act on and sensitize the peripheral nerve fiber, eventually leading to central sensitization that may contribute to the, uh, to the long-term visceral hypersensitivity that we experience uh, long after the, uh, the, uh, any signs of inflammation or injury are gone. So understanding how products of the microbiota and how inflammatory agents act on the peripheral nerve to sensitize it is, an, is, a, is a very proximal important question in the system. Um, let me just uh, say something about the team. So the work I'm going to show you really is a team effort and we've had a, a, a really fantastic time uh, working with this group. So this project is really started by Nick Bologno in my lab, who's a postdoctoral fellow who now has his own lab at Harvard, uh, together with Jim Bayer, who's a pediatric GI person uh, at uh, UCSF, who was a fellow at the time in Holly Ingram's lab. Uh, Jim now has his own lab at UCSF. Ryan Morey contributed to some early phases of this work. Uh, currently, the, the project is, uh, is, is being pine, uh, spearheaded by Koki Tuhara, Nathan Rosen and Eric Figueroa in my laboratory, together with Archana Venkataran in Holly Ingram's lab. Uh, and we've had this fantastic collaboration with Stuart Briley, who's a lot of data you'll see today, who's head of the Visceral Pain Unit uh, in Flinders University in Australia. Um, so the, the area of the, uh, the, the central focus of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is, uh, is in the um, in the colon, uh, in an area that really concerns this thin unicellular epithelial sheet that separates the lumen of the gut from the mucosal surface. Uh, so if you take a cross-section through most any region of the, of the gut, the small intestine of the colon, you'll see these villi uh, in, uh, that are uh, innervated by both intrinsic and extrinsic primary afferent nerve fibers. You'll see this uh, unicellular layer uh, the uh, epithelial sheet uh, in the mucosa that separates, again, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mucosal surface from the luminal surface where all the food goes through, and it's also heavily vascularized. So it's heavily innervated and heavily vascularized. Here's a picture that Koki took a while ago where you can label the um, sensory nerve fibers that come in, in this case with an antibody against the 5-HG3 receptor, uh, and you can see how these uh, fibers go way up and invade the, uh, the, the, uh, the these, uh, these, these villi, deep into the villi. Uh, what's interesting about this thin epithelial sheet is that mostly it's a nondescript epithelium, but every so often you run into an unusual cell, about 1 to 5 percent of the epithelial cells in the sheet, uh, that represent these, uh, um, uh, these specialized uh, neuroendocrine uh, cells. Uh, and they have sort of a little a bit of a brush border that faces the ap apical, on their apical side, that faces the luminal surface where bacteria and foodstuffs go. And then on the basolateral side, on the mucosal surface, uh, they have sometimes this very elaborated foot-like structure. Um, so what are these cells like? There are a number of different so-called enteroendocrine cells, that, and they're excitable cells, as I show you, that release hormones and neurotransmitters in response to uh, a variety of, oops, signals. Uh, and so there are multiple types that have been studied by a number of groups like Gribble and Ryman in many laboratories. Uh, and, um, and, and they have some unusual properties. So they're electrically excitable. As I'll show you, they express a range of voltage-gated ion channels. Uh, some of these uh, enteroendocrine cells respond to irritants. As I'll show you, pungent agents and products of the microbiota that's important for their biological function. Um, And, uh, and some of these, uh, uh, and Horacrutz uh, uh, and, um, and his colleagues have shown that some of these enteroendocrine cells display anatomical uh, attributes of a presynaptic cell, 
So when they project into the mucosal surface where the efferent and afferent nerve fibers come in, it looks like in some cases they form this foot-like structure, and there's some anatomical evidence that they're just not releasing transmitters in bulk transmission into the mucosal space, but rather they are interacting with nerve fibers in a, uh, in a pre- and postsynaptic type of arrangement. Uh, and that's a hypothesis that still needs functional validation, uh, but, is, but is an interesting one that, that I'll show you some data about as well. Uh, uh, the other interesting thing about this in the context of this concept is that uh, cells in the epithelium turn over rapidly, anywhere between 7 and 60 days. And so the question is, if they do form these sort of point-to-point -point synapses, how is that circuitry reestablished during the natural turnover of these cells? It's very similar to what you see, for example, in the, in the olfactory system, where there's a turnover of the olfactory epithelium. There must be a reestablishment of connections to, to maintain uh, sensory coding and information. Uh, and how does that work in the gut? And how does that work, for example, in people who experience injury to the gut or for, who are treated uh, with chemotherapeutic agents where there's a shedding of the lining of the gut? How does this system get reestablished so that we can maintain connectivity? Um, and so we've been interested in a very particular subset of these cells. There are many different types of enteroendocrine cells. There's one particular subtype that we've been interested in, the enter enterochromaffin cell. They, they represent about 0.5% of the intestinal epithelium. The interesting thing about these cells is that they produce about 90% of the serotonin in the body. So they're responsible for releasing almost all the peripheral 5-HT, whereas the central serotonin, as you know, is, is, uh, is synthesized and released by cells in the rat vein nucleus. Um, th these, uh, the serotonin that's then released from the cells interacts with both intrinsic primary afferent neurons. These are neurons that project from the uh, epithelium to uh, intrinsic motor neuron systems, for example, in the myenteric plexus of the gut. Uh, but then there are also extrinsic primary afferent neurons that project to dorsal root ganglia and spinal cord that are largely responsible for feelings of unease, discomfort, or pain that one experiences in the gut. And so we're particularly interested in this circuitry. Uh, and one of the main receptors that is involved uh, in this, in this uh, um, uh, communication is the one member of the serotonin family that's a uh, fast synaptic ion, uh, ionotropic uh, channel, the 5-HT3 receptor, uh, which serves as a very good molecular marker for the e so-called EPANs or the extrinsic primary afferent neurons that, that convey noxious stimuli from the gut uh, to the brain. So we want to know about the biophysical properties of these cells, what their pharmacological properties are, what their connectivity is, do they talk to mucosal afferents, and if so, what is their contribution to GI pain? Uh, the other thing that we'd like to know is um, what are, uh, of the different sensory neuron subtypes that, uh, that innervate the colon, uh, which ones are most responsible for talking to enteroendocrine cells, and therefore which ones contribute to uh, GI pain through this pathway. So we know, for example, there are low threshold, wide dynamic range, and high threshold fibers that innervate the gut that respond to, to stretch and, and distension. Uh, and then there are these so-called mucosal afferents that are not so much stretch sensitive, but rather uh, um, respond mostly to small, are very sensitive to small deformations in the mucosal surface uh, that we think are the ones that interact primarily with these C cells. And among these, which ones really carry information from this region of the gut to the spinal cord? Uh, now, uh, we began this system, uh, this study, and uh, in this project really by trying to understand the intrinsic properties of these enterochromaffin cells. I should also say one thing I forgot to mention is that there's really not very good treatments for, uh, for IBS and other kind of functional pain disorders, but one area pharmacologically that's, uh, that's used uh, to some degree with some success are drugs that, uh, that um, modulate serotonergic systems. And in fact, drugs that block 5-HT3 receptors, which are widely used for treating emesis uh, and other forms of nausea, have some effect in treating IBS. Although it's mostly effective in women, uh, and it's not effective in many women who do, do have IBS. So, uh, in, but in, in order to characterize these cells and ask more about what their functional properties are, uh, um, we've uh, uh, benefited from work of Hans Cleavers and others who have shown, of course, that you can generate uh, so-called enteroids or, uh, or organoids from the gut, which allows us to really probe these cells mechanistically. So it's been known for many years that EC cells release a lot of serotonin, that they're probably involved in some aspect of, of GI pain. Uh, 
uh, but what really hadn't been looked at were their biophysical properties and their molecular properties to understand what their signaling mechanisms may be uh, and to get molecular probes that can be used to manipulate these cells in, in vivo and in vitro. Uh, and so uh, what Nick did first was to probe the, the, uh, the uh, properties of these cells using these enteroids and culture. Uh, and he was able to then use calcium imaging and to, and to interrogate these cells and ask what kind of stimuli do they respond to uh, and what might be the relevance of these stimuli to the physiology of the gut and the gut pain. Uh, and the first thing that he showed, and I'll, I'll go through uh, this work uh, um, uh, quickly because it's all been published, is that these cells are indeed are excitable, similar to what's been found for other forms of enteroendocrine cells uh, by Gribble and Ryman and others. Uh, they fire action potentials. Uh, that, uh, that are TKX uh, sensitive. Uh, they, um, they express a number of, oops, sorry, voltage-gated ion channels that I haven't shown here, uh, including uh, voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels, and potassium channels. So they're really just like a sensory neuron, neuron in many ways. Um, and, uh, and they're capable of releasing neurotransmitters from the basolateral side. Uh, now, the, the most important question he asks is, what are these cells sensitive to in the context of what goes through the gut. Uh, and, and what he found was that there are really three classes of, of agents. One is um, ingested chemicals. So there are a number of things that we eat that activate these cells, and, and, and many of these are irritants. And what he found uh, is that um, there's a class of compounds such as uh, uh, AITC, which is the pungent agent wasabi, and other such electrophilic agents that are strong activators of these cells. And as I'll show you, we and others have shown that these cells express one of our favorite ion channels, namely TRIP-A1, which is known to be the wasabi receptor and activated by these kinds of agents. Uh, he also found that these cells are sensitive to uh, products, commensal metabolites, that is products of, of microorganisms that live in your gut bacteria. And these include uh, a class of so-called short-chain fatty acids that are known to activate a number of EEC cells, but activate these cells particularly well. And in particular, this one short chain uh, fatty acid called isovalerate was a very good activator of EEC cells. And in people who have uh, irritable bowel syndrome and other functional uh, uh, GI disorders, levels of isovalerate correlate uh, with uh, the severity of disease. So this is an interesting finding. The other thing he found is that there are potential endogenous regulators, in, these case, in this case catecholamines, that might regulate these cells. And this is interesting to us because we know that there's uh, feedback through the stress pathway of sympathetic uh, input to the gut. And this is a potential uh, tie-in of trying to understand how the stress response modulates sensitivity uh, and, uh, and hypersensitivity of the, of the GI tract. Um, and then um, gene profiling of these cells show that, in fact, they have a number of potential receptors for these types of agents. Uh, as I mentioned, TRIP-A1, the so-called wasabi receptor, is activated by these kinds of ingested reactive chemicals. Uh, and as we showed, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, we then were able to place some of these other uh, channels and receptors uh, in pathways that can be activated by these different types of agents. Uh, and as you can see here, for example, there are voltage-gated sodium channels, et cetera. So these are excitable cells. They're um, uh, chemosensitive cells, and they respond to a, a wide variety of different types of agents. And you can see these cells, they're beautifully excitable here. I think of this movie place, you can see them being depolarized, in this case just by putting potassium on them. But this, uh, this is the basolateral side of the cell that would release a uh, transmitter, and this is the apical side of the cell. Here you can see it uh, in, uh, beautifully in an organoid, where you see it crossing the, uni the unicellular epithelial sh uh, sheet. So here's a little diagram of what Nick uh, and Jim found early on, and that is, as I said, these cells are responsive to luminal irritants, bacterial metabolites, Another group has shown that they're responsive to cytokines uh, and then sympathetic transmitters. Uh, and and what, uh, what we showed again is that they express TRIP-A1 that can be activated by irritants. This um, orphan uh, olfactory receptor called O558 turns out to be a receptor for isovalerate, and we think that's how short-chain fatty acids activate these cells. They also express other TRIP channels like TRIP-C4, which we believe are important for depolarizing the cell downstream of some metabotropic pathways. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the basolateral side of the cell, uh, facing the mucosal surface, this would be the luminal surface, is a uh, adrenergic receptor uh, that, uh, that we uh, believe is a target for the, 
catecholamines that we showed activate these cells. And then uh, we and uh, Art Bader's group showed that there's one particular voltage-gated sodium channel called NAV1.3 that's specifically expressed on the basal lateral side of these cells. And, uh, and we know that this channel is responsible or is required for the cell to fire action potentials, but it's not clear what role it plays in mediating transmitter release from these cells. But uh, the interesting thing about NAV1.3 is, is that's one of these channels that's often been seen to be upregulated in, uh, in post-injury situations. So we're interested in understanding what this does. And then, of course, there are voltage-gated ion channels, uh, calcium channels, which, when activated, facilitate the release of serotonin so that it can interact with primary afferent nerve fibers, in this case expressing, for example, the 5-HC3 receptor on the so-called, quote-unquote, postsynaptic side. So what we're interested in the long run, as well, is understanding what the interplay is in terms of feedback mechanisms between the primary afferent and other types of nerve fibers that come in. We know that primary afferents are unusual in not only communicating signals to the central nervous system, but in releasing signals peripherally in response to uh, acute noxious stimuli. And this includes the release of uh, neuropeptides like substance P and CGRP and a uh, ATP, et cetera. And in cutaneous sites, this sort of phenomenon uh, uh, initiates this process of neurogenic inflammation that leads to uh, vascular leakage, vasodilation, and the recruitment of immune cells, for example, into the area. Uh, and one question is whether activation of these nerve fibers by the release 5-HT generates sort of a, in essence, a local neurogenic inflammatory response in the gut to turn this cycle of, uh, of pathological stimulation over. And then what about input from sympathetic neurons to release of things like norepinephrine? Does this help to either uh, uh, to modulate this pathway and perhaps to exacerbate it under conditions of stress? Um, so uh, just uh, one uh, histological slide to show you why we think that's similar to what Enrique Bohorkots has shown for uh, hormone-releasing L cells, that there may actually be more of a, uh, an ordered process of signaling in, in the gut between EC cells and neurons. I'll just show you some histology that we've done. So, uh, you know, previously I think people like Michael Gershon and others have speculated that serotonin is released into the gut in a sort of action at a distance mechanism and that it diffuses uh, through the gut to activate nearby sensory neurons. And, and that's probably true in large extent, but I think what's been uh, thought not to be the case is that there's actually more of a specific synaptic contact that's occurring in the gut. Uh, and our histology uh, suggests that that may be the case. So here you can see in blue a, a, five, uh, a, a EC cell stain for serotonin. Uh, and you can see that it's closely juxtaposed to this uh, primary afferent nerve fiber uh, that's expressing the 5-HT3 receptor here in G, uh, GFP, uh, uh, expressing 5-HT3 uh, primary afferent. You can see that they're closely opposed. If you, when, when you look through the gene profile of the EC cell, you see, in fact, that it expresses a number of presynaptic markers, syntaxin, uh, uh, RAB3B, et cetera, SNAP proteins. Uh, and, uh, and when you look at the uh, disposition of these proteins, you see that you can see some of these presynaptic uh, release proteins, for example, expressed in the EC cell. And in the so-called postsynaptic side, you can see PSD95 on the primary afferent, suggesting, again, that there is some kind of at least an anatomical remnant of a synapse. Um, and, and similarly, on the, on the, uh, on the um, baselateral side, again, you can see that the adrenergic receptor clusters here on the baselateral surface of the EC cell. This would be the equivalent of the, of the uh, luminal surface and the basal lateral surface. And if you look at chromogranin A, which lights up the 5-HT-containing vesicles, you'll see that it's also clustered on this side of the cell. So this, again, suggests that there's, we, we know there's polarization in the cell. And if you look at tyrosine hydroxylase expressing nerve fibers, you'll see, again, that they cluster very closely to this basal lateral uh, uh, release site for serotonin at, at this uh, uh, EC cell, again, suggesting that as the case for primary afferent nerve fibers, the sympathetic fibers engage in close synaptic, potentially cl close synaptic interaction with these cells. We've been trying to verify this using viruses and other methods, uh, uh, but so far we uh, lack direct functional evidence for this. But this is something that we and many other people in the field are trying to, uh, to, to work on. The other thing that many people are trying to work on, there was actually an interesting paper in, in, in Nature this week from a group at Stanford, is to develop more specific and better ways to measure the release of serotonin in the gut so we can really understand the kinetics of the release and the 
temporal but the spatial distribution of transmitter in the gut. All right, so, uh, so, so far what I've told you is that we have this rare uh, enteroendocrine cell type, this enterochromaffin cell that releases most of the peripheral 5-HT. It's innervated by both sympathetic uh, and sensory nerve fibers uh, that uh, come into the mucosal surface and, uh, and, and then uh, read information from what the ECLC cell is detecting here out in the lumen. There are a number of channels and receptors that do this, and the question is, uh, or the questions are, uh, does EC cell activation produce visceral hypersensitivity? Is this pathway of the interaction between the EC cell and the mucosal afferent actually relevant to gut pain? Uh, is EC cell activation required for the expression of visceral hypersensitivity? So in the aftermath of, a, uh, of an injury situation, do you see visceral hypersensitivity through these cells? Um, are there sex differences in EC cell-mediated sensitivity and sensitization? So we know that there's a big sex difference in, uh, in behavioral manifestation of these diseases. Where is that manifest? And does this particular locus early on for interaction play a role in specifying that sex difference? Uh, can chronic EC cell activation produce visceral hypersensitivity? That is, does activation of that cell alone, is that sufficient to generate this phenotype? Because remember, the way that this phenotype is currently generated in models is you instill uh, an, an irritant into the colon, something like TNBS or DSS. This creates a very fulminant uh, um, uh, uh, inflammatory response. That inflammation lasts for uh, several weeks, and then two or three weeks after the all signs of inflammation and injury are gone, then the animals are left with visceral hypersensitivity. But can you reproduce that phenotype just by activating these cells? That would be a simpler way of looking at this model and a mechanistically more tractable way of understanding this disorder. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, it, or, or another question I should say is, does chronic EC cell modulation alter uh, behavioral states? So we know people who have uh, many functional you know, pain syndromes, and IBS in particular, uh, uh, suffer from anxiety-related phenotypes uh, as, a, as a consequence of gut-brain interaction. Uh, do, can we observe the, these same kinds of, uh, of, of CNS uh, uh, alteration of behavioral states uh, by altering the biology of these cells? Um, so uh, we've tried to attack this problem by looking at the system from multiple levels. And I should say that for those of you students out there who, who are interested in, uh, in new projects, I, I say this one aspect of, of understanding uh, pain is really an attractive one because you can interrogate the system at multiple levels. It's somewhat similar to cutaneous pain, as you'll see, that you can uh, establish both ex vivo and in vivo situations for understanding what's going on. So in this case, we have a preparation that's very similar to a skin nerve preparation in which you take a piece of the, mucosal, uh, of the mucosa and put it in a recording chamber, and then you can extrude the, uh, the, the sensory nerve fibers that innervate this region through this gap and record from these fibers. And you can poke and prod this receptive field and, and look at firing of the afferents and, and, and ask what happens to them. So this is what we call an ex vivo colonic afferent recording. A lot of the recordings I'll show you here have been done in Stu's lab. He's sort of the master of this technique. And what you can see, in fact, is that if you stimulate the mucosal afferent, in this case with mechanical stimulation, you can develop this mechanical response uh, 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 curve where you look at spikes per second versus mechanical stimuli. And when you put isovalerate in the recording dish to presumably activate the EC cells, in fact, you see that you sensitize these fibers. They're a lot more sensitive to a mechanical stimulus following treatment with, with this short-chain fatty acid isovalerate. And this sensitization can be blocked by using this drug called alosterone, which is a blocker of the 5-HG3 receptor. So this sort of substantiates the idea that isovalerates activating EC cells. They're releasing serotonin onto the primary afferent nerve fiber and activating the nerve fiber through 5-HT3 receptors. If you block the 5-HT3 receptors, you block the sensitization by isovalerate. Um, and, and we can show, in fact, that now the complication here is that the mucosa itself and the EC cells may be mechanically sensitive because they express, some of them express piezo channels, for example, and the nerve fiber itself is mechanically sensitive. So can you show that this sensitization occurs with a stimulus that's independent of mechanical stimulation? And Stu did this nice experiment 
where he expressed channel rhodopsin in the nerve fibers by putting it uh, under control of NAV 1.8 promoter. Uh, and if you activate the nerve fibers optogenetically by shining light on them, uh, you basically get the same result where you can show that isovalerate now sensitizes them by diminishing the intensity of light that's required for them to fire action potentials, and you can see that here. So however you stimulate the sensory nerve fibers, applying isovalerate and activating the EC cells will enhance their activity. So this sort of confirms the idea that they are functionally connected to the nerve fibers and that activating the EC cells promotes hypersensitization of the system. What about in vivo? One way you can show this is to take the same, a, a, a mouse that expresses a, a calcium reporter under control of DAB 1.8 in the primary afferents, uh, and then carry out this intravital imaging experiment in which you image neurons in the relevant part of the spinal cord, the L6 region of the spinal cord that provides the input to the uh, uh, that pro uh, from which the colonic afferents emerge. Uh, and you can still isovalerate into the colon and ask if you activate uh, DRG neurons. And in fact, you can see that there's a small population of DRG neurons, here we're imaging the, the ganglion themselves, that respond to the application of isovalerate. And one of the things that we noticed early on, uh, that we noticed in this case, is that uh, if you look at this in male mice, uh, and Stu mostly has looked at this in male mice, and then he said we should look at this in females as well, you see that when you put on isovalerate, you activate a number of cells in these heat maps. Uh, but if you look at females, what you see is that there's already a lot of ongoing act activity in these cells. And when you put on isovalerate, uh, it stimulates these cells, but not as much in males because you're already at sort of a higher baseline. And you can see that here in these plots where the percent of neurons with basal activity is much higher in females, and therefore the relative effect of isovalerate is blunted in females because they're already closer to the ceiling. So this was one of the first indications that this system, in this system you can already observe sex differences by looking at this pathway, presumably between EC cells and the primary afferent. Uh, now, the, the, the other way that you can look at sensitization is in this, in uh, another in vivo, more of a behavioral assay, uh, in which you look at basically the posture of an animal. So we all know when we have gut pain, we tend to hunch over and our abdominal muscles tighten up. Uh, and you can see the same kind of postural changes in a mouse when, it, uh, when it's subjected to, uh, to situations that lead to GI pain. Uh, and you can measure this by putting a, a transmitter in the animal in this case a wireless transmitter, and measuring changes to the uh, measuring activation of the abdominal muscles uh, in response to, for example, putting a balloon into the colon and inflating it and activating the primary afferent nerve fibers in the mucosa. Uh, and if you do this, uh, what you can see is here's a dose response curve in a male where you increase the pressure of the balloon and you measure uh, the um, activation of the, uh, of the um, abdominal muscle wall through this transmitter. Uh, and if you instill isovalerate into the colon uh, and do this, you'll see this big sensitization of the response. And you can see here in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the raw traces how much of a sensitization you get. And here's plotted uh, as well. So isovalerate is truly sensitizing the system very significantly. Uh, and interestingly, in, re in, in keeping with what we saw in the ex vivo system, in females, you see this somewhat higher baseline, and you see some sensitization by isovalerate, but relatively less. And we think that's because the females are already pre-sensitized. So we think that these assays are telling us what's happening at the level of the EC cell mucosal afferent, uh, and it's beginning to reveal some differences uh, uh, that we could relate to sex to try and, uh, so that we can try and uh, piece apart where this uh, mechanistic difference is occurring. Um, so the, now the question is, can we really ask what the contribution of VC cells is genetically? Can we ask about their necessity and sufficiency for generating these kinds of responses? And the way that we've done that, of course, is to use chemogenetics and to express two, times, two types of molecules uh, in the EC cell specifically using an intersectional genetic strategy that I won't go into now, but I'm happy to discuss with people later, where we can specifically target expression of these chemogenetic tools to the subset, the 1% of enterochromaffin cells within the gut epithelium. Uh, and, um, and we've used two types of chemogenetic tools. One is tetanus toxin to uh, uh, abrogate, um, to cleave um, uh, some of the machinery that's required for release of vesicular 5-HT from these enterochromaffin cells. 
Uh, and what you can see here is uh, if you measure serotonin release in response, for example, to uh, putting AITC onto organoids that are derived from these mice, what you can see is that you get a diminution of the serotonin release. There is still some serotonin released from these cells. There are a number of questions that we'd like to ask. One is, is there a regulated pathway for serotonin release and more of a constitutive pathway? What component of serotonin release is mediated by activation of these different receptors? Uh, and these kinds of measurements are done by taking an organoid in the culture and then releasing 5-HT in some way and then measuring the released 5-HT in the bulk fluid using a, um, an ELISA assay. And we're trying to develop techniques where we can look at this more specifically and, and somewhat more quantitatively to really try and dissect out the mechanisms for serotonin release in response to uh, activation versus constitutive release to really understand what's being regulated here. But in any case, using these rather crude tools, we can see a pretty significant decrease uh, in the amount of serotonin released uh, in response to AITC in animals in which the tetanus toxin is being expressed specifically in these cells. Uh, on the flip side, what we've done is express a, a, a so-called dread receptor uh, in these cells that can be activated with a synthetic agonist such as CNO or DCZ to ask what happens when we activate these cells specifically. Uh, and again, here, if you put on DCZ to activate the dread receptor, you can see that you push more serotonin out of these cells compared to vehicle controls or to tac Cree wild-type animals. So we have this ability to at least to some degree to control these cells, to uh, inhibit release of serotonin or to promote release of serotonin using these chemogenetic tools. And the question is, what effect does this have on these different assays in which we can probe uh, different indices of visceral pain? So again, going back to this ex vivo mucosal afferent recording system, uh, we ask what happens when we um, take these nerve fibers and in this case, again, use a mechanical stimulus put on isovalerate, so tac Cree is the, is the wild-type animal, and ECPF tox are the litter mates expressing the tetanus toxin receptor. And here you can see that there is a, uh, a sensitization by isovalerate. And in fact, in this prep, sometimes we see sensitization in both males and females, but in either case, this is completely abrogated in animals that express the PF tox receptor, suggesting again, genetically, that isovalerate is acting more or less specifically on these EC cells, and that that's the main pathway that's responsible for sensitizing these afferents. Um, what about if you look at these mice in vivo using this uh, so-called visceral motor response? Uh, and here we see a, a bigger difference in males and females. So in, 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 uh, in males, we see that the response is diminished uh, pretty significantly uh, in response just to inflating a balloon in the colon. So the sensitization, the sensitivity of the colon and the primary afferents in the colon is diminished by expressing this PF tox. But in females, we see a really big difference. And we think that's because the females are already sensitized with respect to the males, and so the window of, of differential drop is much bigger in females compared to males. So we see this very uh, profound phenotype in females where uh, the ability to activate the nerve fibers by uh, doing mechanical stimulus in the colon is almost completely diminished by inhibiting release of serotonin from these EC cells. Um, now, what about on the flip side? Can we instigate a, uh, a sensitization response by activating these cells with uh, something like uh, uh, through a dread receptor? And in this case, you can see that in males, we can sensitize the response in these ex vivo nerve preps by activating the dread receptor by CNO, whereas in the females, again, that response is somewhat more blunted, uh, as, as one might expect if females are already at a higher level. Uh, and again, the same thing is seen in the uh, in vivo response, where you can see that uh, providing DCZ to males uh, through, uh, through uh, uh, sub-Q injection sensitizes their response to a uh, mechanical stimulus, where in, whereas in females, the sensitization is much more blunted. So all of this together is uh, providing a picture that um, activation of EC cells is sufficient to sensitize the system. The sensitization is greater in males than it is in females. Uh, presumably because there's a window difference in terms of where females start at and where males begin. And we're trying to validate this through, uh, through other methods. These sort of assays uh, leave a little bit to be desired in terms of comparing animal to animal, but comparing animals uh, within a cohort in terms of treatment, this, the, these sort of assays are actually quite near to um, Now, one of the uh, uh, important questions that we want to ask is, can we mimic 
maladaptive um, uh, IBS-like situations simply by manipulating these cells. Uh, because if we can, this would really show the, uh, the importance of EC cells and their interaction with the primary afferents uh, for this process of maladaptive sensitization. And it would provide us with a much simpler model to understand what the mechanisms are uh, for visceral hypersensitivity because it would be a model in which there's no previous um, uh, injury to the gut and there's no previous inflammatory episode that's creating a lot of havoc within the gut and would really simplify the pathways that we need to look at. So in order to ask this question, uh, what we did was um, implant the transmitter and then wait two weeks and then begin to, uh, this is in a mouse that expresses a dread receptor, and then, and a male mouse I should say, and then deliver uh, the, uh, the dread agonist DCZ every day for a period of three weeks to continually activate the EC cells once a day. Uh, and then we have the so-called washout period where the animals are, do not receive any drug. And then we ask what happens to the visceral sensitivity using this visceral motor response. Uh, and what you can see in this slide is that um, the baseline response is greatly enhanced in animals uh, that uh, in dread animals that have received uh, a daily DCC injection. And you can see the comparison here, for example, between wild type uh, mice and their uh, dread receptor expressing ruminants. And in fact, you again also see a difference between animals that have received vehicle and those that have received uh, uh, DCC. So just activating this pathway by activating this dread receptor in these EC cells is sufficient to produce what looks like a persistent visceral hypersensitivity. And one of the experiments that we're doing now is to ask how long this period of sensitization must be. What's the minimum time over which you can activate these EC cells and render this system hypersensitive? And how long will this go? How long a washout period can you sustain and, and retain visceral hypersensitivity? How much does this mirror IBS? Does this go on for a day, for three days, for a week, for a month, for a year? And so this is now a system that we think is really amenable to study uh, that we can really try and tease out what the role of these EC cells is to visceral hypersensitivity and how much does it really mimic an in vivo uh, maladaptive situation. Uh, and then lastly, we're trying to figure out which subsets of afferents are most responsible for this. Anatomically, uh, uh, it looks like probably these so-called mucosal afferents must be the ones that are uh, that are uh, uh, most responsible, but these other low, wide dynamic range and high threshold fibers are ones that have been thought to play a role in visceral hypersensitivity over the years, which also includes some of these what we call silent nociceptors that sort of come to life when there's uh, injury to the gut. And one way that you can distinguish these is to make, is, is to use this, uh, what's sort of called a circular preparation in which you basically make a round gut loop that then you can pressurize. And under those situations, the low threshold, wide dynamic range, and high threshold fibers, which are really sensitive to distension, uh, can be measured. But the mucosal afferents are pretty silent under those conditions because they don't respond to, uh, to, um, to stretch of the, uh, of the gut, but rather respond to very small changes uh, in, the, uh, in deformations of the mucosa. So if you, if you look at that preparation, you can see the activation of these different, uh, of the low threshold, the WDR, and the high threshold afferents. And what we could show is that none of those subtypes of fibers are modulated by uh, activation of the dread receptor or, for that matter, by applying isovalerate. So the conclusion from this is that all of the act actions that I've showed you in terms of sensitization are carried out by these <coughs> mucosal afferents that, that, uh, that come in close contact with the EC cells in the villus and, and really with very little contribution by these other fiber types. Now finally, uh, we wanted to ask what happens, how far can we take this system and look at the consequences of activating the CC cell mucosal afferent signaling pathway in terms of uh, other types of behaviors, uh, uh, um, ones that are really read out through the brain in terms of cognitive responses. And here we've just used a very standard elevated plus maze uh, 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 paradigm to measure anxiety in these animals because anxiety is one of the uh, uh, comorbidities, if you want to put, that, put it that way, of many people who suffer from, uh, from uh, functional pain disorders and, and in particular from uh, um, um, uh, visceral pain syndromes. So uh, in, in this assay, 
what we did was to take a dread mouse and inject it. This is work of uh, Archana, and inject it with DCC to activate that pathway. And you can see that the animals do exhibit uh, a pretty significant increase in anxiety by spending less time uh, and traveling less distance in the open arms of the maze and instead staying in the protected arm. We think that this is really due to the activation of the dread receptor and to the, activa uh, uh, to the activation of the EC cell mucosal pathway because if you give them a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist to block that transmission, you see that you abrogate this uh, anxiety response uh, uh, with either measure. Um, the interesting thing is if you look at also uh, animals uh, so you can see that uh, both of these responses are, uh, this response is significant. The difference is, uh, is diminished by blocking the signaling between the EC cell and the primary afferent. If you look at animals in which uh, uh, that express the PF tox, that is ones that inhibit activation of the EC cells, you can see that this also has some effect on the uh, anxiety uh, uh, related behavior of these animals. Uh, this was a little bit surprising. It's not as quite as profound as you see by activating the system, but maybe suggests that any perturbation to GI physiology, either by inhibiting activation of the EC cells or by promoting it, le uh, 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 leads to uh, a sense in the animal that there's something wrong and, and uh, leads to an anxiety phenotype. We're trying to probe this more carefully to really see how specific this response is, but we think that it's a, a reasonable behavioral measure of, of what's happening in the gut that we can pair with the, this now new model of, of hypersensitivity in the gut. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, I hope what I've shown you today is that EC cell mucosa afferent signaling drives visceral pain. We think this is a major locus for driving uh, uh, IBS-related pain. That higher basal EC cell activity in females may uh, um, underlie the sex differences that it's observed in visceral pain. It's at least one locus that we'd like to look at more carefully, mechanistically, to ask if this is really one uh, main factor uh, as to why uh, um, females experience visceral pain more, more often than males. Uh, that prolonged EC cell activation is in and of itself sufficient to recapitulate persistent visceral hypersensitivity. Uh, it, uh, this is really an exciting result to me because it says that we now have a simpler model to understand mechanistically what's happening in maladaptive changes in the gut that drive persistent activation of this nerve fiber uh, and, uh, and persistent pain. And um, modulation of EC cell mucosal signaling, uh, uh, at least by the uh, experiments we've carried out so far, elicits behavior that's associated with functional GI disorders, in this case anxiety-like behavior that suggests that there is bidirectional gut, or, or is consistent with the idea, of course, that there's bidirectional gut-brain signaling uh, that's important in these maladaptive responses. Uh, the work in the lab uh, that I've told you about supported by a couple of private foundations, the Simons Foundation, because they support work on autism, and many autistic children suffer from, uh, from uh, visceral pain syndromes. Uh, the Raymond Foundation, which supports work on IBD and IBS, uh, and most of the work is supported in my lab by the National Institutes of Health. So thank you again for uh, inviting me to be here and tell you about mostly this unpublished work uh, and to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your exciting presentation, which is open to questions. So. Yeah, I have actually. To, ah, thank you very much for your, for the lecture. It was super nice, and I enjoy a lot. Um, I have two questions. They are related, uh, and I cannot make this those split. So. The first one is in females, in humans, chronic pain is more frequent in females, in women than in men. Is it known that is the same, exactly the same in mice? So I think it is, it is already answered during the whole um, lecture. And my question is because uh, from every sensory system, the sensory system, what is measuring is the difference before and after something, any stimulation. And 
if you see the data in males, they are more silent, so meaning that they can respond much better to an, an stimulus. While female, they are already active, so measuring a change will be more difficult. So if I see just the data, I would say male are more sensitive to pain than females. So that's, that's just surprising for me from the data and from the other data. It, it is interesting to add, well, first of all, I should say, is the same true in females compared to male, mice, to humans, in terms of sensitivity? And that's an interesting question because um, people really haven't looked that much. So Stu, for example, who's been working in this field for many years, uh, has only used male mice predominantly, and that's, of course, for the reason that most of us use male animals because they don't go to the estrous cycle. And so we don't have that confound of, of cycle and hormones in most of our behavioral assays, but most people have not looked at females. And so this is, I think, what, you know, one of the first examples where at least in our lab we've begun to ask this question. So it's sort of a, a, a new answer in a way. In terms of this baseline sensitivity, yes, you're right. You can look at this from either way. Uh, and, uh, but given the data that we have, what we're presuming is that females are more on the edge that they can respond, and they do, and you can see in some of these assays, but they're closer to the threshold of, of, of hi being hypersensitized. And potentially because of that, it's easier for the female system to go into a situation where it's persistently sensitized, whereas the males uh, have to be activated at a much higher uh, um, level to actually cross that threshold. That's at least a hypothesis that we're working on. But now with this ability to manipulate the system that hopefully we can control it a little bit more, we begin to ask those questions about gain and threshold more consistently. I thank you very, very much for your nice talk. And uh, I, I like very much in your career, your uh, veritable comparative approach in your studies between different species and vertebrate classes. One very minor comment about the last s slides about the behavioral part of your feeling studies. Um, the plus maids is a classical test, yet it is biased by the fact that any simple motor components may result in a change in anxiety levels. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have other behavioral scores supporting this last anxiety part. Yes, Thank good, you. Yes, that's a good question to look at other behavioral scores. I mean, one of the things that makes us somewhat confident about these data is, is the use of velosterone to block this system. Mm -hmm. um, but we have looked at things like nest building, uh, and um, there's no differences there. But we need to look at uh, other mechanisms or other assays of anxiety and, uh, to really sort of solidify this. I, I agree with that. But the, the, you know, the elevated plus maze test is the, is the test that is most reliable, I think. We also have looked at motor activity in these animals in terms of total distance traveled, et cetera, and we don't see any differences there. So it's not some kind of a perturbation to uh, locomotion in general. Um, uh, but you're right that I think one test for these complex behaviors is, is a hint, but needs to be followed up more carefully with other behavioral assets. Thank you. Uh, fascinating talk. I was fascinated by the fact that you say these cells are turning over and that dividing as yes. an optrus sensor. Do yeah. you see any difference in turnover or innovation Yes. After injury. So that's a good question. We're, we're looking at that now. That's basically a lot of histology work. And we're trying to see two things. One is whether there's any difference in turnover. And the other is whether when you uh, activate these cells persistently, for example, with DCZ, do you see a change in the, in the degree of innervation of, uh, from the primary afferents in the villi and their association with these C cells. So we're cutting a lot of sections going through that now, but that's, you know, possibility that we 
Grazie, eh, sono Aloisi di Siena. Uh, I would like to know if uh, uh, you have any, any data about uh, uh, hormones and uh, this kind of uh, activity because uh, as you said of course uh, uh, the differences between sexes uh, are, has to be made, has to be something to do with, uh, with uh, hormones also, also because uh, women know very well that uh, during the cycle there are differences also in the activity of the gut yeah. and uh, this is a question. The other small question is uh, uh, the gut is full of uh, receptors for opioids, and uh, the opioids uh, act, uh, uh, I mean, change completely the activity of the gut. So did you find any, any relationship with uh, a C activity or something like that? No, I'm sorry, what did you say? The gut is full of, what was it? The uh, opioid uh, uh, receptors, sorry. Oh, receptors. I, I said, yes, I said, what I said, yes. Um, sorry? Opio oh, opioids. Oh, we haven't looked. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, the, of course, the 5-HG3 um, receptor was initially discovered as a sort of opioid responsive circuit. We haven't looked at opioids in the system, but I should say Holly's lab, Holly and Gerdahl, is particularly interested in the role of endocrine hormones uh, in, uh, in physiology. And there are, there's a lot of estrogen receptors in the gut, and they're currently characterizing the estrogen receptor subtypes, whether they're expressed in these cells or other EC cells or other uh, um, epithelial cells in the gut and, um, and have been making selective knockouts. So we are asking this question together as to whether uh, these sex differences involve um, uh, estrogen hormones and if that's helping to regulate the system. We don't know that yet, but that's the set of experiments that we're uh, working on.